because I, I believe what he said and I live what he said. I'm Chris Taylor. My company is Evergreen Leadership. And we do leadership development for lots of companies. And what I'm going to share with you today is a, um, a collaboration that lasted most of last year with Sensory Technology. And I'm wor working with a big Fortune 50 company. And they um, had engaged me to, to put together um, a training series over time with folks both here and across the globe. And I knew that their learning experience had to be really good. Because the, the design of the course was that we were doing half-day sessions. And anybody that's been on the end of a phone or the end of a video conference for a half-day session understands that we've got to think about this. So I reached out to Sensory. Uh, we both used their space and their brain power and learned a lot through the eight months. So I'm going to share with you some of our shared learnings. OK. The first lesson I learned was that it moved in providing instruction from a solo performance to one in which it was really a, um, a partnership. And I learned very quickly the role of the producer, having somebody in the room with you to be your technology support, your technology backdrop was really, really important. And the role of that person wasn't just to make sure people were connected or to fix it when things got broken, although that was certainly really helpful because I didn't have to worry about that stuff, but to do what you just saw happen here. Uh, work with me ahead of time to get things set up. Make sure things were working, monitoring connections. Um, in this case, oftentimes, depending on the technology we're using, it was this was the person that managed the camera. So that sometimes it was on me as the instructor, and sometimes it was on the person that was interacting. Um, and so having that producer, having that technical support, however you find it, is really important. Really important. Um, the other big learning was that many of you have been on audio calls or video calls, and you know that the tendency is, is when you're cooked in remotely, is mute down, do a heck of a lot of other work, right? But unfortunately, that's not very conducive for learning. If I'm designing a really rich and robust learning experience, I want people engaged with me. And I've got to figure out how to keep them engaged, especially over four hours. And so thinking through those dynamics are really important. And what David said about the power of turning on video, what you'll notice is once you turn on the video, if you've got those capabilities, all of a sudden people are with you. All of a sudden the learning gets more robust. So my number one strategy, um, if you want to kind of avoid multitasking, is to have people turn on their videos. Lesson three is it surprised me. I've done instructional design for a long time, for probably about 30 years. And most of the instructional design I did was audience in the room, sometimes a small group, sometimes a huge group, um, with PowerPoint, with lots of activities, but still in a group that I could manage and see eyeball to eyeball. And so moving into this virtual space, I had to really rethink how I designed courses. And I had to be a lot more detailed because I wanted to engage people. I wanted everybody to have a good experience. I had to think through what those transitions looked. And that list that David put, put up about all the things you've got to think about is really important. How are they connecting? Are they going to have audio and video? What's going to be the quality of their connection? How do we break into small groups and make that happen? What happens if they're connecting from home? And so knowing all that in advance and then planning that out in my instructional design became critical. And I had to think beyond what were our outcomes, what do we want people to learn, how can I make that happen, what kind of slides do I need, all those are still there. But then I had to walk through step by step and think about, and how do we do that with technology? How is it that we break into small groups? If we're going to break into pairs, how can that work when I've got people all over the place? It can be done, but it takes a lot of work. And that was where that role of the producer came in, too, because not only were they with me the morning when I'd come in to get set up, typically we'd do a run-through before the session and said, here's what I'm thinking, how can we make this happen? And here's what I need you to do. 
This conference room needs to get ready to go because the people that are here and live need to move down the hall. We're going to have to set up a different connection. So instructional designing is very different. But you do need to have a plan. In fact, the plan is everything, and then the plan is everything again. When I do live training with people in a room, and I can see them all face to face, whether it's for half an hour, or whether it's for a whole day or multiple days, I've got this amazing ability to adjust midstream. If something's not working, I can blow that out and say, OK, let's all get in small groups. OK, come on back. I'm going to explain this one more time. Um, let's do something different than I had planned. You have less flexibility when you've got people joining virtually. And you've got to think through in advance. And that takes being smarter about it. So this is actually a copy of um, the documents I would create in which minute by minute, here's what we're going to do, here's how long it takes, here are the slides I'm going to use, here's what I'm going to be doing, here's what they're going to be doing, and how we break out. Um, the other thing, and this gets back to this notion of how is it you build engagement, you've got to mix it up. I knew there was going to be nothing more deadly than me talking to people for four hours. I could not do four hours of lecture. It wouldn't be very effective learning. It would just be a disaster. And so there are lots of ways you can mix it up. But again, because you're using technology, you've got to think through how that works. We did a little bit of lecture. Typically, I would do 10, 15, maybe 20 or 30, but that was it. And then we would break into small groups. Sometimes we went into pairs. And I just had people call each other on their phones, right? Um, when we went to small groups, we had to decide how you get connected up virtually again. And luckily, Sensory had some breakout rooms that we could use. But you've got to mix it up so that people are engaging. When you do um, discussions, you've got to think about the fact that the people that you can see are much more likely to participate. And the people that, even if they're in video, um, are less likely to raise their hands. Because we've all been on these calls, right? There's this oddness of not knowing just when to interject. So as a facilitator, if you're doing those group discussions, you've got to think about how do you make it easy. Oftentimes, um, we would do round robin kind of things. And sometimes we would start geographically. Like, I want to hear from the folks in Europe, and now Asia, and now we'll come back to the United States. Sometimes we would do alphabetically. Say, OK, I'm going to start based on your last name, and I'm just going to walk you through. And just chime in and, and give me a word or two, or share with me your thoughts. Um, as a facilitator, I was always also very conscious of um, checking with the people that were there. Because I had people in the room with me, and I also had people virtually. And asking, what do you think about that, Steffi? Peter, what's your thought on this? Anything else going on? Sometimes I'd start with them first, and then the rest of the folks later. But to do effective learning, you've got to somehow mix it up. And mixing that up technology-wise, again, takes a plan. Test your connection before, during, throughout. And you know sometimes that changes. We uh, made sure before our first session that the folks in Germany tested their equipment, loaded the software, we tested bandwidth. We thought we had it. And so we come in, we set it up, and the bandwidth for Peter was awful. And I've got the producer, the person who was helping me, working frantically, talking with him offline, trying to figure out how to get his experience better. Well, what had Peter done? He had tested it in the office, but he went home to do the training. So that ability to test before, and then I, so I learned from that, right? I asked the people that were participating virtually, and where are you going to be? And if they say something different than the office, then I would say, can we test that out? You're also, and this, this is the value of having that producer in the room, they're testing and they're watching bandwidth the whole time. And they can get in front of issues that you're having. Um, but as an instructor, as somebody leading the meeting, leading the training, check frequently as well. Oftentimes I use transitions. When we would come in at the beginning, how is it? Let's go around the room and check, the virtual room. How are we sounding? Does everything sound OK? Are you connected good? How's the video for you? And then we come back from a break, just checking again. 
the other thing that's helpful is to give people the ability, stated as a ground rule, stated up front, that they have the ability to raise their hand at any point it goes south. So if bandwidth goes south, instead of waiting till a break, instead of waiting till the end, say something quickly. And you've got this wonderful person in the room then that can help you. Um, another big lesson for me is that I'm used to being in a group and establishing eye contact with the people I can see. And then you've got these people on the camera. And so understanding that you're teaching to the camera as well as you're teaching to the people in the room is just a, an instructional habit that I had to get used to. And it was kind of funny in the sensory um, hive room because the camera was back here, right, focusing on me but we were projecting up the visual images of the participants behind me. And I always caught myself wanting to talk to their picture and always had to say, no, talk to the camera, talk to the camera, talk to the camera. It was also interesting because we did a little experiment once and we moved to a different place. We went to their um, corporate offices and they wanted to kind of test what their facilities were like and what their IT support was like. And there, the camera was fixed. It was a good virtual meeting room, and it actually moved to whoever was speaking, but it didn't have that capability to focus on a speaker or a presenter. And we got feedback really fast that that didn't work very well. So, and in that lo lo uh, vein, try stuff out, figure it out, get feedback, fail fast, and then learn quickly. So this example of when we went to their corporate training room and tried it out, it was a good experiment. It's kind of yucky for the people participating virtually for that session. And so we learned very quickly. We also learned that the tech support on their premises was not nearly what it was in the other place. That was really where I learned the importance of tech support. Because they only showed up when I really forced the issue. Even though I had met them ahead of time, we tested it or whatever, they thought it was pretty fail-proof. I get in early, I test everything, I can't get the system up, I can't get people connected. I'm tr calling their 1-800 number, I'm trying to rouse somebody up. And finally, about 20 minutes after the class started, somebody who was very grumpy walked in and said, I don't know why people can't do this. We tried to make it as foolproof as possible and clearly put out. So we lost a lot of instructional space. And when you've got people out there waiting, that's a big deal. Um, encourage everybody to kind of walk in their shoes we did this, one of the, um, actually the leader that had chartered this training happened to be in Germany and participated in a session virtually. She was a trusted person who was able to see what the experience was like and come back and report on it. And we made big changes after her. Um, it wasn't awful, but she had lots of good suggestions. So whether you get somebody that's trusted, that will give you straight up feedback and be a virtual participant, and let you know what's working and what's not. Um, I'd also encourage you to participate in virtual trainings and see what people are doing that works, that doesn't work, that makes you crazy, that gets you excited. But being in that role is really important. The second lesson I'm gonna share, or the 10th lesson I'm gonna share with you is this is just if you're working with a global audience. If you're working with folks for whom English it's their second or third or fourth or fifth language sometimes. What do you do? And we had done an exhaustive review of this class. That again, we're half day sessions, eight months in a row, um, with lots of you know, good thought put into how we presented it. And here's what we learned, is frequent breaks are important. If you're trying to process information virtually, and it's not your primary language, people's brains need a break, right? And so I'd recommend about 15 minutes every hour and a half. We've done kind of two 10 minute breaks, but thinking about giving people a break, not just to stretch their legs and get away from the screen, but to give their brain a break because they're working really hard if English isn't their primary language. Sending materials in advance, because being able to read it and see it and hear it really, really helps, whether it's your slide presentation, a reading, a pre-work, some key points, but getting materials in their hand ahead of time so that they can see it. And then the third piece of feedback that we got loud and clear was three hours was about the max, so we will not do four-hour classes again. 
But to that tune of, if you think, and for a lot of folks, if you're reaching a global audience and you're doing it across time zones, for the folks in Europe, no matter when you do it, it tends to be at the end of the day. For the folks in Asia, no matter when you do it, it tends to be a really bad time unless everybody in the US is you know, doing this at midnight. So thinking about how you, you chunk it into smaller pieces. Um, I'll be around for questions. I'd also love to hear people's ideas of things they've done that's working. I think this is new space and we're learning all the time. So thanks for coming today to learn a bit. <laughs>